tales for dark nights. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes from author John Grills, entitled Claustrophobia. I don't remember anything about that morning. You'd think I'd remember it all, but the more the time passes, the less the details hang around. It's really only the stuff I try hard to forget that hangs around. We stood there in the cool silence of the morning, Terry and I on the edge of the cave opening. Our bell lines draped over the lip as they had been countless times before in countless caves. All things considered, I still considered myself a spelunker, while Terry took pride in calling himself a caver. What's the difference? In Terry's words... Cavers are the ones who get called in when the spelunkers screw up. As a weekend warrior at best, we started exploring caves together in college, but as the years went by, life got in the way. I spent more time in the outside world while Terry went deeper and deeper inside. If he wasn't caving, he was holed up in a lab at his oh-so-classified job. I really had no idea how hush-hush his work was, but he'd changed the subject when I asked, so I left it alone. We didn't see each other enough to get into arguments about things like that. I remember Terry coughing a few times as he looked down. Something felt off. You okay, Terry? I asked, adjusting the harness. It felt smaller than the last time I'd used it. Yeah, fine, he said without looking away from the hole. There was no further conversation, just the moment of consideration before dropping nearly 100 feet into the waiting abyss. The only sound was the slight zip from our descending on the ropes and the rustling of our scant gear on the way down. At the bottom of our descent, I unclipped my line and looked up. The circle of light, slowly fading from pink and purple to clear blue, staring down at me. I took a slow breath, a sort of ritual I do, like the last breath I'll get to take with me as we disappear into the darkness. I looked over at Terry. You good? I asked. Yeah, he said almost solemnly. Then I said, respect the cave, and he repeated it like we always did before we made our way inside the tunnels. The cave was all new to me. Terry had done the research on it. He read the reports, talked with other cavers in the area. It wasn't a virgin cave, but that wasn't really why we were here. That allure tended to fade with age. For the next hour, the only sounds from us were the long, dragging sounds of fabric and bodies across rock, labored breathing as the walls got smaller and smaller, forcing us to our knees, then our bellies as we inched alone, hugged by the stone. Squeezed by the world... Finally, we came up to an opening, not much bigger than a walk-in closet, but enough so that we could sit up and take a break, get some water, just sort of be there in the warmth and silence. Water? I asked Harry, handing him my bottle. 
I don't know why for sure, but I just felt like I needed to break the silence somehow, and it didn't feel like Terry was going to say anything without prompting. It was one of his moods. Terry nodded and took a drink. What are you thinking so hard about, I asked. If I wanted you to know, I'd be talking, he said. It wasn't exactly done out of spite, it was just sort of his way. I haven't seen each other in six months. Three hours in the car, another hour after the drop, a hundred meter crawl through that last pipe, and nothing? That's really how this is going to go? Terry just stared straight ahead at the stone, rough wall. I'm fine. No, you're not. This ain't the place, Dr. Phil. The hell it isn't, I said. There's nothing in here but truth, man. You can lie to yourself all you want, but the rock doesn't care. It's just you, me, and it. And you're not going to talk about this at all? Doesn't make me feel any better about going any deeper with you. I need to know you're here in the moment. Why, out of nowhere, did you call me up and say we need to come here? That's how it went with Terry. You just kind of forgot about him when he wasn't around. He was terrible at returning calls and emails. It turned into a friendship of convenience, and even that was wearing thin, no matter how long we'd known each other. I wasn't up for any more games. I had a life, too. Terry sniffed slightly, took another drink from the water bottle before sighing. It's just been a bad week. So I gathered. Damn near the only time you want to cave anymore is when you've had a bad week. Terry looked down. Never had a week like this. There was something in his voice, something hurt. I can tell. He shook his head and handed the water back to me. No, man, uh, you, you can't. The only time he ever got into one of these moods was over women. It took me a second to remember her name. Katie. We'd only met once prior. We sat there for a while. The silence is different down there. Sound doesn't really carry like you'd think. It just doesn't echo. It sort of dies. Even the scratching of our gear adjusting on the rock barely registered. I took an educated guess, hoping it would get him to talk. When it's over, it's over. You know that. She knows that. You really want to keep lying to yourself about it? I sort of braced myself for whatever Terry could think up in regards to me being wrong, me not knowing what I'm talking about. He didn't say any of that. Maybe it's my fault. I scoffed. I couldn't help it. Knowing you, probably. Thanks, he said. What was it this time? Screw you. You know what I mean. There was another long pause, and I wondered if the trip was about to end early. Things are just different now, he finally said. What changed? He grunted as he adjusted on the rock. I don't know. Stuff. Work. Life. It was a strange thing to hear. Terry loved his job. He loved to be cryptic about what he worked on. He loved the money. Dream job lost its shine? Something like that. He said as he moved to a crouching stance, turning toward the next pipe. That's all I get? I asked. Terry bent down and moved to the lip of the hall. We've got a long way to go. Turn on the lights. Turn up the heat. Close your eyes. Start to breathe heavy. And you are there with us. With one big exception, you can turn on the lights and see that you aren't somewhere deep inside the earth, surrounded by tons of rock scratching across the skin on your back, shoulders, and stomach. Remember to breathe. Just breathe. Breathe. At the next room, we both half collapsed against the wall, sweat stinging my eyes. That got tighter than I expected, I said. Terry bit a huge chunk out of a protein bar. Yeah, a bit. Next one's like that? I asked. That's what it says, Terry said, shining his light toward the next opening. Looks about the same from here. Great, I said. Worth it? 
Terry took a long, deep breath and exhaled. He sounded relieved, like the stress he'd been carrying with him finally started to melt away. Absolutely. Different kind of pressure down here, huh? I asked him handedly. Your segues suck, Terry scoffed. Maybe if you just get it over with, uh, we can save the usual routine. What's that supposed to mean? Terry said, shining his light toward me. You, acting like a chick, making me pry stuff out of you that you want to say anyway. Eleven years we've been caving together, and I can count on my dick how many times you've scheduled one of these trips just because. This is your therapy. Just embrace it. Terry stared at me blankly. Am I really supposed to gloss over the count on my dick line? It means once, I said. I assumed you were counting STDs, he said, finally cracking a smile. Your sister keeps calling to apologize, I said. Terry actually laughed. <laughs> At least you didn't say my mom. Too needy. I had to block her number. I miss doing that with Terry. It was juvenile and crass and really not that clever. But it was ours, just two friends being friends, forgetting everything else. I missed you calling, Terry said. Oh yeah, I could really corner the market on caver therapist comedian. You're a spunker at best, he said, and took a long drink of water. Wiping his mouth, he continued, It's just life, man, that's all. Yeah, no need to worry about that. Even in the darkness and shadows of the room, I could see Terry's face contort as he thought about something. I had an accident in the lab. The statement caught me by surprise. What? I... I can't really talk about it, but I messed up. Can't talk? I can barely find the words. Are you kidding me? You say you have an accident at the lab, then you can't talk about it? Terry scowled. That's why I didn't want to talk about it. I can't talk about it. Then, with Katie... Jeez, can we just stop talking? I eased back. I had no idea if that was bad. Part of me was mad that he wanted to go caving instead of get a drink somewhere and actually talk. Y yeah, man. Yeah. Sorry. We continued on for another hour in silence. The heat and the darkness and the rock were our only company. We squeezed and contorted our bodies through passages. Deeper and deeper. Just breathe. Until we were in a pipe, only a few inches of room between my shoulders to the wall and separating my back from the ceiling. Terry was a few feet ahead of me, moving at a pretty good pace when suddenly he stopped. At first I didn't notice the scraping noise his body made as he crawled along and had stopped, but when I did... What? What's wrong? I asked, my voice barely more than a muffled echo. All I could hear were my own lungs straining for air. Terry, are you okay? Panic doesn't even begin to describe that moment. Say something. Finally, a distant, muffled voice said, I... there's something... The words barely registered for me. They just didn't make sense. What? When you're in that kind of absolute darkness, any artificial light is noticed, especially when it goes away. That's when I realized Terry's headlamp turned off. I twisted my head the best I could, barely able to see his shoes. There was no light beyond mine. What's wrong with your lamp? I asked. Terry's voice came out matter-of-factly. I can see it. I ignored the comment, one problem at a time. Turn your lamp back on. Can't you see it? He asked. His voice was so flat, so docile. Terry, man, I want you to turn your headlamp back on. No response. Terry! The silence dragged on into forever before I heard his next words. I don't need it anymore. The panic that I first felt 
well, that was nothing compared to what I felt at that moment. There's this thing, I guess you'd call it a phenomena with cavers, people who've actually experienced the absolute darkness of depth, people who've been places where not so much as a proton of light exists. It's called sight without sight. It's the moment without aid of flashlight or lamp in the nothingness that your mind perceives everything around it. Images appear before your eyes. You swear you can make out the rock around you. You claim you can see your hand in front of your face. In short, you can see perfectly. It's impossible. There is nothing in the darkness. It's just a trick of your mind. But there was something about Terry's voice. Terry, I said, I'm going to start moving back. I'm going to give you some room, okay? Turn off your light. See? His voice wasn't flat anymore. He sounded happy, almost wistful. Moving back was all I said. You need to see it. I kept inching my way backward. There's nothing to... You need to see it! He yelled. The sound didn't die. It swam around me. I actually felt cold despite the heat. I put everything I had into getting back out of the hole. But the thing is, there's no forgiveness in rock. The walls and ceiling grated against my skin as I squirmed out. I could feel the raw rash of skin wearing down even through my clothing, the sweat stinging the new wounds. But all of that pain paled in comparison to the fear I felt at that moment, trapped under the earth with a man I still considered to be my best friend. I kept trying to talk to him as I struggled backward. Terry, you gotta breathe, man. You gotta control yourself. We're gonna be fine, but you need to focus. Remember where we are. The words just sort of fell from my mouth into a jumble. They meant nothing more than an idea. A frantic idea of how I was supposed to save my friend, a man who had begun a spiral into madness. Terry's voice impossibly became audible in my ears, no more than a whisper, but so crystal clear he could have been standing next to me. I know where I am, it said, and I know where you are. Then the sounds of violent coughing resounded in the distance. I tried to call out to him, but there was no answer. I can't explain what it was. Something about the coughing sound so pained that I couldn't leave him. I had to get back to my friend. He was panicking. But that just meant he needed help. It took me almost ten minutes to get back to Terry. My body felt like an open wound. I was just behind him. I could hear him crying. I talked to him. Just talked. I asked him if he could move forward just a little. He didn't have to go too far. When he did, I asked him to do it again. After about ten feet, I spotted a speck of black on the edge of my light. It was blood. Terry was leaving a trail of blood as he moved. I barely kept it together. Finally, we made it out, first Terry, then me, slowly rolling to a low crouch in the next room. I put my hand on either side of my friend's face and gently lifted it up so I could get a look at him. Check where he was bleeding. What I saw... The flesh on Terry's face looked as if it had been dragged behind a truck on a dirt road. Bits of sand and dust flecked the shining raw skin, slicked with blood and shining under the light of my lamp. I could see the pale white protrusion of bone under Terry's right eye where the skin and muscle had been completely torn away. His eyes were closed, and his head lolled gently with pained breaths. Oh my God, Terry, what did you do? What happened? All Terry could manage was a mumble. My mind raced in circles. Okay, okay, we gotta get out of here. Terry mumbled again a little louder. Stop trying to talk. Save your strength. We need... His words cut me off. Did you see it? He gurgled. Well, what? Do you see it? He said more loudly. To see what? Do you see it? He asked and opened his eyes. I swore and fell backwards 
scrambling to get away from him. He finally opened his eyes, or at least the lids, to reveal the space where his eyes had been. The ocular cavities had severe gashes in them, as if his eyes had been pulled out by claws. Fluid leaked from the wounds. I couldn't look at him. Terry! I couldn't stop a dry heave from coming, and I doubled over coughing. Man, you, you gotta sit down. I can, I can go for help. Help? Terry asked. It was such an innocent word like he'd never heard it before. Why would I need help? Suddenly, I saw a flash of light as pain exploded in my jaw. Terry punched me. My teeth ground and scraped together, and I slumped against the nearby wall. If I hadn't been wearing a helmet, I probably would have cracked my skull open on the rock. When my vision cleared, I saw Terry looming over the top of me, crimson rivulets pouring from his torn face and eye sockets and dripping onto my feet and legs. He leaned closer. Drops of hot blood splashed onto my face, dripping into my open mouth. He snatched the lamp off my helmet and smashed it against the wall, plunging us into total darkness. What residual energy the bulb had soon faded to nothing. Dark. Darker. Absolute darkness. And in that darkness, Terry's voice hissed. Now do you see? I couldn't stop the tears. Terry, what are you doing? You don't see? His voice had moved. It was further away, disappointed. I coughed. In the darkness, I had no way of knowing if I was about to pass out, but the dizziness made it obvious something was wrong. Words fell out of my mouth. I can't see anything. No, Terry's voice said, again from a different location. Do you see? I felt so tired. I can't see. No, no, not with your eyes. Stop using your eyes. Please, let me take them for you. His voice was on top of me. I screamed. There was nothing for me to see, so I just started to swing my arms in all directions, trying to keep him away from me. I screamed and swatted and inched my way along the walls, praying to feel it fall into a tunnel, praying for an escape. And in that moment, that moment my hands found emptiness, my body jolted forward, diving into the pipe. I grunted and scraped and swore and bled as I made my way down the pipe. All the while behind me I could hear Terry's sing-songy voice. I can see you. I screamed at him to stop, but he only laughed. The rash of exposed skin on my body grew with each hysterical movement in the tunnel, scouring my flesh like a cheese grater. The heat made me pour sweat. My legs started to cramp and my eyes burned from the salt and dust. Only my need to survive kept me moving. Inch by inch, foot by foot, I continued on until at last my body felt nothingness and I tumbled into an open room. I immediately scurried forward, praying for another pipe, praying that I had gone the right direction toward the exit and away from Terry, what used to be Terry. Panic knows nothing of time. My mind started to wear down along with my will and my muscles. The sweat and tears mixed together with the dust to cake around my eyes. Seconds stretched into eternity. When I saw light up ahead, not the light of the lamp, but light filling the tunnel, I thought it was hallucinating. I had repelled into the tunnel. Escape! As I made my way into the circle of light, one word escaped my lips. No. There would have been no one there to hear my prayers. As I crawled from the cavern into the circle of light, what I saw, it made no sense. I repeated that word. No. Isn't it beautiful? 
Terry's voice asked from right behind me. It's hard for me to put into words what I saw. I know it sounds weird, but it makes me think of Sunday school class. I saw the torment of damnation. I saw an endless cavern lit by fires. Fires fueled by bodies stacked atop one another like cordwood. Arms reached out to me. Eyes pleaded for help. Burnt, curling lips begged mercy. Now you see, Terry said as the fires began to dim and the room darkened. I don't understand. I groaned, collapsing, sprawled on the ground. Understand, Terry repeated. Breathe. Just breathe. When the light is gone and that feeling starts, all you can do is breathe. Even when you forget it's possible. The moment the fires are out and I realize my body is paralyzed, stuck in position, trapped on all sides by a rock, squeezed so hard that my arms fold inward beneath me, the rock bottle necking downward, conforming to my body, pinning me at the waist, so tight that I can't even move my feet, trapped within the rock, squeezed by tons of immovable inevitability, suffocating, just breathe. Terry's voice fades in my ears, see, feel, absolute darkness. When I come to, I'm in the hospital. My body's in traction, the list of injuries is extensive. I'll never walk again without a limp. I don't know how I'll ever pay off the hospital bills. The fact that I can walk at all could be considered a miracle. I was found by some hikers at the bottom of the cave and airlifted out. When I asked about Terry, no one has answers. I had a head injury. I must have fallen at some point. Hallucinated. But then how could I remember so much? I don't know where Terry is. No one does. Some people come, they ask about Terry, where he is. They ask about what I saw. I tell them, why shouldn't I? As they leave, I see them saying something to the doctors. They want to run some tests on me, something to do with my blood. I don't have answers. Maybe Terry went crazy. Maybe I went crazy. Maybe it was something else. Terry's voice echoes in my head. I had an accident at the lab, he said. What was he working on? What did he do? Sometimes I go back to the cave. I don't go in. I never go into caves anymore. People call it claustrophobia, the fear of confined places. But that's not right. I'm not scared of those places. I'm scared of what's in those places. But most of all, I'm scared of seeing Terry again. Because sometimes, when the breeze hits the mouth of the cave just right, I swear I can hear words in the wind. See it. Our second story for this evening is brought to you by author J.D. McGregor, entitled Swells. Can you hear it? Daniela asked. I tread as gently as I could. My head held above the surface. I heard nothing from the depth below, only the sound of laughter further out. No, I said, I can't hear it. I looked out towards where Theo and Camilla were swimming. I wanted to believe he had to drag her all the way out there with him, that it was all part of some elaborate scheme that I was capable of learning myself, but it wasn't. She swam all the way out there on her own, laughing the entire way. She was smitten. Preferring not to think about it, I turned back toward the shore. Olive-colored trees scattered over the golden-brown mountains, the slopes were steep and rippled. 
If they existed back home, people would be lining up at the gondola all winter. And there it was again. The thought had crossed my mind. Home. Why did it keep coming up? Two weeks ago, I sat in my office, flicking a pen, waiting for five o'clock, desperate to get on the plane and start the South American adventure. Now that I was here, all I thought about was getting back into the routine. I tried to bring myself back to the moment. I'm sure it didn't exactly appear as it did the last time I looked. The waves, crashing against the cliff edges, were bigger. The recoil was a violent white. Directly below me, I noticed the depth of blue had gotten deeper. There aren't any sharks here, are there? I asked Daniela, trying to keep my voice as calm as possible. No sharks, she said, suppressing a smile. She dove down. As she did, her legs rose above the surface before following. I admired the spectacle. I wondered if I swam out as far as Theo did, if Daniela would follow me as obediently as Camilla did for him. There, I hear it, Daniela said as her head popped back out. Listen close. Tide is coming in now. It's starting. I plunged my head beneath the surface. Again, I couldn't hear anything. No big grinding noise like what had been advertised. Perhaps the details had gotten lost in translation. As I emerged again, I saw Theo and Camilla swimming toward us. Did you guys hear the sound? I asked. No, dude, nothing, Theo answered. I think these Colombian girls are lying to us. Just wanted an excuse to drag us out here. Both girls giggled. By this time, the four of us were all treading water no more than a few meters from each other. Camilla's breasts bobbed at the surface. Jealousy burned through me. Theo had seen them bare the night before. I didn't get anywhere near that with Daniela. Wait, Theo said. I think I heard it just there. What? Still don't hear it. Maybe you just need to go a little deeper, bro. Theo lunged forward and two muscular arms pushed me beneath the surface one more time. He held me there for a few seconds, his hands firmly, but not painfully, gripping my shoulders as scattered schools of fish swam between my feet. I kicked at him on the way back up. Not surprisingly, the girls laughed as I returned. I started a race through any number of comebacks or physical responses. I came up with nothing. Theo was my friend. Certainly not my best, but still a friend. He was also the only one willing to tag along when I brought up the trip idea a few months ago. But the guy was just more dominant. He was higher up the ladder at the bank back home. He was bigger, better looking. He took more risks. He... <sighs> the sound interrupted the thought. It was only faint, like distant thunder. But it was there. It came from the ocean floor below us. The water stirred and bubbled. Wow, what was that? Theo asked. Cuevo bajo el mar, Camilla answered. And what is that? We show you. I stayed at the rear of the group as we swam back towards shore. The waves were even higher than they were a few minutes ago. Water dripped down from the receding ledges all over. We had to climb out. The narrow beach from which we entered had disappeared under the rising ocean. Water had soaked the bottom of my towel. As I dried myself with the part that wasn't wet, I looked out at the bay where we had just been swimming. The landscape was almost unrecognizable. Round sand and rock had given way to turquoise blue. It was as if I were staring at a completely different place than where I had arrived. Grrrr! A deep sound came again. It came from below the spot where we had been treading. You could still make it up prominently from the shore. What exactly does Cuevo Bajo el Mar mean? I asked as we started along the same jungle path from which we came. Cave beneath the sea, Daniela said as she stepped off the path into the jungle thicket. Careful, watch for snakes and spiders. Her route 
curved away from the main path in the direction of the point. The jungle was like a sauna. Minutes after leaving the cool water, Theo and I were completely drenched with sweat. Our clothes stuck to our backs like an extra layer of skin. I could hardly believe it when we got there. Just short of the tip of the point, a cave entrance opened into the ground. You would never have seen it unless you knew exactly where to look. It was completely hidden from sight, from the beach, the water, and I bet even from the mountaintops. But when standing in front of it, the entrance seemed like a mirage. The opening was like a miniature trap door on a bed of rock. It led straight down. At the bottom, you could see that cave continued downwards toward the sea. The trajectory looked like it was going to send you straight into the water. It was so narrow that only one person could pass at a time. Sand covered the bottom landing. It slowly gave way to stones until the cave floor became completely rock further in. However, the most remarkable thing was the view as you descended. I was the last to witness it. You faced the ocean as you went down. You were well above the water before you started. But just as you disappeared underground, you could see it. Your eyes were on perfect level of the surface of the ocean. Everything changed at the bottom. The walls and ceiling were moist. Water dripped down from above. The air was cold. It was nothing like the extreme heat on the surface. As you ventured further in, it became clear. You weren't just on par with the ocean down there. You were below it. The cave literally tunneled under the ocean. Instinctively, I reached for my phone. I was convinced I would need the flashlight app, but it didn't take long for me to realize I was wrong. The main cavern was already lit. A natural yellow light filled the area. It glistened off the dark, moist walls and ceiling. I looked around, trying to see where the light was coming from. Theo did the same. I heard the waves of the ocean crashing above us. Salt water dripped down into my eyes as I searched. I discovered the light source atop a slope at the far end of the cave. It was steep, and the only wall that didn't arc in a circular fashion above you. At the top, just below the highest point, there was a crack. Through this little break in the rock, a sliver of light shined through. It must have been some kind of natural wonder. The crack was no more than half a meter wide, and somehow, some way, something behind it was shining into the darkness, illuminating the entire cave that rested beneath the ocean. I had never seen anything like it before. Grrrr! It was so much louder than it was at the surface. It was less like thunder down there. It sounded more like grinding. The cave walls seemed to shake as it echoed all around us. The light's brightness faded. The sound source was unmistakable. It came from whatever lay behind that crack in the cave wall. I started to worry about the cave's stability. Somehow I doubted the Columbian cave that burrowed beneath the ocean complied with any safety standards I'd be comfortable with. I imagined the cave ceiling opening up in millions of gallons of water above, crashing down on us. I felt like I was in a tomb. Grrrr! It was deafening. The light above us faded slightly again. The girls and I stumbled back. Not Theo, though. He stared at the little crack in awe as he approached the slope below it. His mouth unhinged hanging wide open. He resembled a child marveling at whatever phenomena lay before him. The idea would not leave his mind from that point forward. He was infatuated. You can't climb, Camilla said. Too dangerous. Nobody goes up there. Theo didn't turn back. I imagine he didn't even hear. Back at the hostel in Santa Marta, Theo leaned back in his patio chair. The ashes dropped to the deck as he tapped his cigarette. The hot day was behind us, replaced by a mild evening with a cool wind coming off the ocean. The crack of light in the cave had lingered in our minds. The party was in full swing around us. For different reasons, neither of us really cared to join. I took a swig of my beer and looked up at him, and 
He spoke directly to me for the first time since we left the cave. I want to go back, Theo said. I knew that it was only a matter of time before he broached the subject. We had to plead with him to leave in the first place. Not doing that, Theo. I don't care if you come with me or not. I'm going back. I need to see what's up there. You don't even know the way. Seriously, you think you can really navigate through the jungle on your own? I won't have to. I'll get someone to show me. He snapped his fingers in the direction of the bar. It caught Camilla's attention. She smiled and dropped the glass as she was cleaning in the sink. Can I get you boys something? She said as she approached. Sit down. Thera responded as he gestured towards an empty chair. She looked at us nervously before complying. Camilla, can you take us, or me, back to that spot tomorrow? She shook her head, no. Come on, pretty girl. It's the last day of my vacation. Let's spend it out there together. I know why you want to go. No climbing up. Dangerous for you. Theo chuckled and leaned forward. He placed a hand on her knee. I need to get there one way or another. Maybe if I ask Daniela. I gripped my seat the moment he said that. Through the crowd of travelers around the bar, I looked through to the reception desk. She leaned forward, smiled, and chatted with a guy who must have just checked in. I'd be damned if I was going to let him, or even worse, Theo, move in on her. Come on, Camilla. Don't make me get up, Theo said. She won't show you. Yes, yeah, she will. I'll make it worth her what? Don't worry about it, I said, interrupting him. I stood up and pushed the seat back. I'll take care of the directions. Let's see what's up there. Theo lifted his hand from Camilla's leg onto his glass. He raised it in my direction and looked at me in a way he'd never had before. The faintest grin came to his face. Well, how about that? I ran my glass against his and down the rest of my beer. I forced myself in the direction of the reception desk, pondering exactly what it was I was about to get myself into. It all happened so fast. Morning came before I was ready. I took the facade further than I meant to. As the little motorboat started, I still couldn't believe it was real. I'd scribbled the directions Daniela had given me on a little paper map. She was resistant to give them up. Pressuring them out of her had also ruined any shot I had at any extracurricular activity. I couldn't rationalize to myself how it was worth it. Before starting our trek, I considered the voyage through the jungle. The chance of us getting lost was too high. And I knew that Theo would try and go regardless. I had to find an alternative. Part of me was amazed. How in the hell I had managed to give directions to the local fishermen in part broken Spanish, part simplified English was beyond me. By the water, it was more direct. Seven bays east. How hard could that be? The real question now was who was I trying to impress? The girls back at the hostel, living their lives, probably transitioning to the next flings with new white boys traveling through. Was I trying to prove that I wasn't a wimp to Theo? Was I trying to prove it to myself? I squinted against the sun as we cut into the oncoming waves. Santa Marta started to disappear in the distance behind us. I sat in the back next to the fisherman who had one hand on the motor. My finger grazed along the map, trying to keep track of where we were. Theo knelt down at the bow, peering onto the ocean in front of us, as if he was the captain, the one in charge of the entire voyage. In his mind, he knew what he was getting himself into. He wasn't afraid of anything. We continued to pass the bays on our right. Each one disappeared on the horizon more quickly than the last. I felt the slightest bit of nausea as we passed the sixth bay and turned into the seventh. It was instant recognition, just like the day before. The tide was coming in strong, eating away at the shore. The boat scraped against sand and rock as we reached the shallows. I noticed the fishermen carefully surveying the surroundings. Theo hopped out. 
Knee high in the water, he trudged towards the shore. I picked up my bag and meant to do the same. Before I could, the fisherman grabbed me by the shoulder. Cave, he said. I nodded. No go. Dangerous. I hesitated only for a moment. When I looked back at Theo, he was already out of the water. He held his arms out wide, wondering what the holdup was. Come back. Four hours, I said, holding four fingers up to the fisherman. Grrrr. The thunder sounded just as I hit the water. I braced myself and started toward the shore. The way to the cave was easy enough to find. The bushes and shrubs had been trampled on the way the day before we left. Enough of a trail, anyway, for us to follow. I felt like a sweating puppet the entire way there. Like it wasn't me, but Theo who had control over where I was going. The cave opening stared back at us. It was inviting, if for nothing else than for the cool air that I knew was down there. Aside from that, I resented it in every way. Did you dream about it? Theo asked as he took his first steps down. The light? It's all I could see last night. He disappeared into the darkness and below the ocean. For a few moments, I stood at ground level alone. I had already come so far. I couldn't see the use in turning back then. The grinding felt like a twisted welcome call. I began my descent. Just like the day before, the catacomb was fully lit. Light beamed through the crack, making the cavern beneath depths completely visible. It looked just like the day before, perhaps a little dimmer. What in the hell was up there? Theo already stood at the base of the slope. He looked up at that little crack of light. His hands shook with excitement at his sides. You're actually going to do it, aren't you? I said as I stopped next to him. Theo nodded in acknowledgement. He reached for the ledge just above his head. His hand slipped on the dripping rock. He tried again and got his grip and hoisted himself up. Please don't. I pleaded as his feet planted just above me. Don't do it, Theo. It's just not worth it. Grrrr. As always, it grounded louder than before. Theo turned away from the diminishing light briefly. Coming? No. Promptly, I jogged back toward the cave entrance. I hoped so much that he would follow. Whether it be out of sympathy, confusion, or pity, I didn't care. But he didn't. When I turned around, he was already a third of the way up the slope, like a four-legged spider he climbed with surprising ease and finesse. He was undeterred by the dripping water and the growing space between him and the cave floor. The cave walls shook again. More seawater dripped down. The yellow light that acted as a barrier to whatever the sound came from dimmed. The whole place was just different. It was then that I felt the change as well. The envy toward the better man now on the final stretch of his climb lessened. In its place came a deep, burning desire. I longed to prove myself to myself. Not out of social obligation to be a bigger man, but a genuine ambition to discover on my own exactly what the hell was up there. There would be no excuses this time, no jumping through mental hurdles to convince myself that it wasn't my fault nor a big deal. I marched back toward the base of the slope. I looked up at the yellow shining light and saw it anew. No longer was it something to be feared or avoided. Now it was only a warm invitation. I thought I understood exactly what it was Theo had been seeing all along. Grrrr! As I reached for the same ledge where Theo had started, the light vanished. In the blackness, I looked up and saw that he was now squeezing his body through the crack, blocking the cave's access to the light. It quickly returned as his bottom leg pulled through and disappeared. 
He made no sound when he reached the top, no shriek of brilliance or discovery. The cave felt nearly silent. I only heard the faint sound of crashing waves above and salt water dripping down. I pulled myself up to the next ledge. My hands and feet moved on their own. They found the little holes and crannies in the rock wall themselves. My mind wasn't there. It was lost in the brilliance of the light. What could possibly be up there? Why did I let Theo get there first? My foot slipped. Momentarily, my entire body was suspended only by the strength of my arms. In a less fortunate position, I would have fallen, but there were no thoughts of climbing down. There was no second-guessing the decision. My fingers ached as I passed the halfway mark of the slope. My body, drenched in water, shivered in the cold cave air. How did I not sleep with Danielle? The opportunity was there. If it had been Theo, he would have done it on the first night. He would have done it without any effort and moved on. He wouldn't have waited around evening after evening too scared to make a move. Grrrr! My ears rang after the impact of the grinding sound passed through. The cave shook again and feeling the nausea invaded my stomach. Yet still there was no concern. Climbing back down was not an option. I'm not going home. I'm not going back to the same cubicle. Forget getting up every day at 6 a.m. to catch the train. Forget staying late and... Grrr! I was almost at the top. But my arms and legs wanted to quit and let me fall. I was so close to that light that that was just getting dimmer all the time. Just a few more meters. Help! Theo's voice was weak, desperate. Didn't sound far off from beyond the crack. I was about to pull myself through. I reached the opening. It looked smaller, so close up. I started to wriggle my body through. The wet rock scratched and cut exposed parts of my skin as I did. I went into the light. The cave behind me fell into darkness. I scraped my way through until my body became free from the narrow clutches of the rock. On the other side, I slipped down into another cave. This one was miniature in comparison to the main one I had just been in. It was barely big enough for me to kneel down. The source of light then revealed itself. It was nothing more than natural sunlight. It poured through a small opening, led out to another part of the shore. It was at the end of the tiny tunnel leading from the cavern I was now in. It looked like you could make your way through. You could make it back to the surface and complete the circuit of the cave. That's what I imagine the one obstruction between the light and I tried to do. Theo was wedged in the little space between me and the way out. Little rays of sunshine poured through the spaces his body did not occupy. Grrrr! My hand shot to my ears in a desperate attempt to protect them. The grounding sound was just in front of me. Everything became clear. It was exactly what Theo had been chasing all this time. There was no celestial being or incredible natural phenomena. It wasn't something that couldn't be comprehended through human perception. It was merely one giant boulder. It was the one part of the cave that was detached from the rest. It acted as a ceiling, the only piece of material separating the little tunnel from the crashing waves above. The grinding sounded as the increasing movement of the ocean pushed it down, scraping it against other parts of the tunnel. It lowered no more than a centimeter, pushing down on Theo's body against the rock floor of which he lay. A slow, agonizing whimper escaped his lips as it did. A little more light disappeared from behind him. Help! He said again, turning his head in my direction. He had barely enough space to make the maneuver. His eyes glared at me. They were bulging, desperate. I crawled forward and grabbed at his nearest arm. I pulled gently at first, and he did not budge. I tried harder again, but the result achieved was the same. I could hear the swells of the ocean crashing bigger waves against the shore above. 
We couldn't have been more than a few meters below the sea at that point in the cave. Grrrr! The rock ceiling lowered another centimeter. You could hear cracks in Theo's body as he was pressed harder against the tunnel floor. His face was squished in place permanently, staring in my direction. Ocean water started to not just drip from above, but pour into the little cavern. Water started to pool around my feet. My time available to spend there was dissipating. Theo heaved. Moisture from his breath rose as he tried to blow the ocean water away from pooling around his mouth. He said nothing. He looked at me as if he expected me to find some kind of solution, something we both knew full well did not exist. His ribs collapsed. Bones snapped at all different parts of his body. He made no sound as the side of his skull started to depress. The water level rose again. Still, he was there, conscious. Still, he stared back as the water reached his lower eye. The truth is, Theo didn't drown to death. He wasn't so fortunate. No, Theo was simply crushed by the boulder that pinned him there. As the waves pushed harder and higher against the shore, and the weight of the water above increased, the rock above just kept pushing down one slow grind at a time. As I backed away through the little crack where we both climbed in, we both knew full well that he was going to die, and it was the worst feeling that he or anyone else could ever imagined. It was nothing more than natural human curiosity that had driven us there. There was no external factor to pin the blame. It was an impossible pill to swallow. I know, because Theo told me. It was the last thing he said before the boulder was pressed down flat against the tunnel floor. Thanks for joining me this week for tonight's regularly scheduled Tales of Terror. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Tonight's program has been brought to you by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly, your host, Otis Jiry. Got a scary tale of your own you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com for your chance to have me bring your sinister story to life. If you enjoyed what you heard, and are joining us on your favorite podcast app. Subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode, and leave us a five-star review and a comment for your chance to be entered into a weekly prize drawing. Your feedback means a lot to us. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already... Be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories or the Otis Jiry channel, my own digital home away from home, where you'll find dozens of previously released horror and sci-fi stories from yours truly. If you'd like to connect with or support me and CTFDN, visit the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Facebook page or at their website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can support our programs by becoming a patron and get access to hundreds of stories all ad-free. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with another pair of terrifying tales that'll keep you up all night. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>